am uh, one of the board of trustees for uh, Fast UK and um, thank you to everyone that's joined so far. Um, so we're just going to give a quick update on um, the National History Study and also uh, Laurent's going to then talk about the clinical trials that are starting or that have started um, in Oxford. So we want to start with you, Dara. OK, so uh, first of all, I'm very happy uh, that we're all uh, here again. Uh, we've had a very successful webinar in July. Uh, that was great. And I'm very, very happy that we have the chance to repeat it and um, give you an update of what is going on currently in Oxford. My uh, part is going to focus on the natural history study um, that is has already started. The last time we had the webinar, it hasn't started. So it's, uh, it's great that now we can already talk up for something that is happening. And I'm going to show you this slide. So this is a visual diagram that I have done uh, to help me follow the developments in the therapeutics of Angelman syndrome. And I have to tell you that this is something that gets outdated very quickly, easily, and it's something that I have to update uh, even on a monthly basis. So there have been a lot of clinical trials uh, for Angelman syndrome in the past as well. Uh, there have been trials that were testing uh, pharmacotherapies, uh, therapies that were aiming to target specific symptoms, specific aspects of Angelman syndrome. But all of, all of them were below the UBE3A deficiency. And this is why we call them downstream treatments. What has really changed uh, the outlook um, the last years is that a lot of different therapies that aim to treat the root cause, the UBE3A deficiency, uh, have actually um, been uh, in, have actually started being in development. And now we can already talk about some of them being tested in human uh, in clinical trials. So for these treatments that aim to treat the cause of Angelman syndrome, the UB3A deficiency, there are two main categories, two main mechanistically different categories. So one of them is uh, those treatments that aim to um, to stop the stop and silence the paternal process. So yeah, so what I was saying is that uh, the one category are those uh, treatments that aim to stop the stop, to, a to stop the long non-coding RNA that naturally silences the paternal copy of the UB3A from stopping the transcription of the, of the gene. And then we have the other category that are those therapies uh, that aim to replace the UB3A in the neurons. So from those two categories, uh, the antigen oligonucleotides belong in the first one. So they're basically small RNAs which hybridize with this long non-coding RNA, uh, lead to degradation and lead uh, and leave the paternal copy free to transcribe and produce the UB3A uh, protein in the neurons. So these are, are already in phase two, which means that are being tested, um, are being assessed for primarily their safety in human trials, but also, uh, well, very, very as a secondary um, objective for their efficacy, but that's very uh, in a primary uh, stage. And then as a second category, we have those that aim to replace the UB3 um, protein and a main representative are the, the gene therapies. So these uh, kind of therapies basically use a non-pathogenic virus as a vector to deliver the gene in the cells and then produce the UB3A uh, protein. And we have two uh, different types uh, of uh, therapies that actually belong in this category, which are very close to human clinical trials, very close to be in phase one. So for all these different um, potential therapies, uh, there are different programs that develop them. So we're not talking about one, uh, two and three programs. We're talking about, uh, well, 11 or 13 programs that develop all these different therapies. So that's very important because uh, all of them have slight differences which might lead to them being more or less safe or might lead to them to be more efficacious even with slight differences. So before I move to describe um, our natural history study, I would like to show you this slide which is kind of trying descriptively to give uh, an idea of how the drug development process works from the preclinical stages through clinical trials to drug approval uh, stages. And I would, what I would like to point out is that 
Um, except for the except for the uh, lab experiments that we're all waiting to see uh, the results of when a compound is being tested in animal models. And except for all these clinical trials that we are all waiting to see the result of because we know that they might lead to a drug approval, there are several other types of research which are happening alongside and they feedback these main experiments or these main clinical trials. So for example, when when it comes to preclinical research, we have all these different uh, sorts of research which aim to develop animal models which are representative of a disease, which are representative of all different genotypes of a disease. We have all these different um, studies that aim to develop organoids to test the compounds. And as you can imagine, uh, the more we have, the more representative they are of a disease, then the best idea we will have of how this compound uh, is going to be when we actually take that compound out of the lab and we assess it in human clinical trials. And then when it comes to human clinical trials, we have some different type of studies which actually give us the tool in order to be able to ask the questions, do these treatments work? Are these treatments safe? And this type of studies are those studies that are either natural history studies or studies that aim points and biomarkers which are basically sensitive um, for the specific disease that is being that um, is being uh, for we test in clinical trials and which are hopefully assessor independent so they are not dependent uh, on human factors for, for of the for the of the person who is actually conducting them and then Moving towards the drug approval processes before when we have a, a compound approved after clinical trials because we saw that it was safe and efficacious, then we need to have uh, in hand the results of those studies that show the impact of the disease um, on the society, that show epidemiological data and show the impact of a disease on the healthcare system because only through these results we will be in a position to get the approved drug compensated by healthcare systems. And as a next step, we need to have these newborn screening methods um, in place so as to test and give those treatments as soon as possible. After what I've described, um, I'm going to talk about the natural history study that we have uh, set up in Oxford and which we have now started. So the main objectives um, uh, that we had when we set up this natural history study was to obtain a better understanding of the natural progression of Hagelman syndrome. Uh, so through this study, we wanted to be in a position to identify these outcome measures and these biomarkers, which are objective and suitable. So we wanted to set up this study, um, as I said, to obtain a better understanding of how Hagelman syndrome progresses over time naturally and uh, to find these outcome measures which are sensitive uh, to change, which are objective from us, from the assessors, which are being developed uh, hand in hand with families, and that's the best way for them to be meaningful actually. And these biomarkers, which are based on technology and lab-based techniques, which makes them again objective and reliable. And we also wanted to facilitate the design of clinical trials through all these, but also through patient recruitment. We wanted to see which is our population in the UK and which people can be potentially suitable for the clinical trials that are also coming in Oxford. And of course, the primary objective is to connect with the community in the UK and understand which are the current deficiencies and needs. So the natural history study that is currently running in Oxford is a two year prospective observational study. Well, that means that we basically do not intervene. That's why it's just purely observational. And it's prospective, it means it happens in the future. So everything happens in the future. Nothing is being done on pre-collected data. So participants in this study can be individuals of any age and any genotype, as soon as they have a genetic confirmation, a genetic report that says that they have been, uh, they have a genotype, uh, basically they, are, they have Angelman syndrome. So, we're aiming to recruit 40 participants uh, that was based uh, on a power analysis in order to have meaningful um, results and uh, these participants are going to be from all around the UK. Um, so far we have recruited 15 participants. The age range is 2 to 13 years of age uh, with a mean age of 5 and a median of 4. 
Uh, seven patients have a deletion genotype, three have a point mutation, three UPD, and two an impredict defect. Um, so just to give you an idea of the four main components of this study, first of all, we have a lot of assessments and questionnaires uh, which are aiming to assess either uh, through the individual or through the family, different domains which are affected uh, by Angelman syndrome. So we have different types of tools. Some of them are tools that are you might have already um, met in clinics, like the Bailey on the Vineland, developmental tools. And some of them are tools which have been specifically designed for Angelman syndrome, like the Orca communication uh, uh, questionnaire uh, tool, which has been uh, designed by Duke University. But apart from this uh, component, which includes you know, different question, different tools, we have um, another component, uh, which is basically, uh, as I said before, aiming to find endpoints based on technology. And this is uh, the Actimayo device. It's a watch-like device uh, which participants take home and wear for a month after every visit. And um, we basically try to uh, monitor movement continuously and identify uh, movement-based uh, endpoints, uh, which can be used then in clinical trials to assess progress uh, of the disease over time and correlate with the other outcomes that we have in the study. We also collect uh, blood in order to uh, perform uh, what we call a proteomic analysis, which is basically um, a quantification of the proteins that we have in the blood and correlate that uh, with uh, the clinical condition, the, the clinical outcomes that we see in every visit and with the different genotypes. And we also do an EED, uh, a 24 hour EED, because uh, as we might all have heard so far, uh, there are different um, there are different patterns that uh, we might be able to see in the EED of uh, individuals affected by Angelman syndrome. We know that already, but we're gonna plan. Uh, we're planning to do a more concentrated analysis after this study and see if we can identify something that is very representative and can then be used in clinical trials. And last but not least, uh, during the first visit, we collect blood um, and we create what we call a DNA biobank uh, with the aim to develop. Um, genetic assays to be used for newborn screening methods in future research, not as part of this study, though. So going back to um, uh, the drug development diagram that I showed you before, uh, with this study we contribute basically in the development of endpoints and biomarkers. Uh, we contribute in uh, the health economic analysis, and specifically for that, uh, we are already setting up a collaboration with other institutions that their focus is uh, basically on that, on epidemiological analysis and health economics analysis. And, um, uh, and we have a very fruitful collaboration, um, um, hopefully uh, soon coming up specifically for that part, which is very helpful for the drug approval processes. Um, to give you an idea of how the visits work, uh, during the two years uh, we have five visits, which means that uh, we see participants every six months. There is a difference between the first visit and the follow-up visits. So during the baseline visits is probably what we would call probably the most burdensome part of the study, because except for all the questionnaires that um, that uh, we do for all the follow-up visits and all the assessments that we do for all the follow-up visits. We also do a 24-hour EED. And for this reason, especially for people who are coming from far away, who are not living close to Oxford, we ask participants to stay overnight in Oxford. And for that, we compensate um, the participants. Of course, uh, that we wouldn't be able to do on our own, that we are in a position to do because the study is very generously supported uh, by Fast UK. And, um, and yes, so what we do is that we do uh, questionnaires, assessments together, then we do the blood sampling as we would do in every normal clinic um, follow up, and then we do the EEG. Uh, you go to home or to the accommodation, um, and then the next day we meet again to finish some of the assessments that we didn't have time to finish um, on the first day. Then after the visit, um, 
Uh, what happens at home is that uh, the participant wears this watch-like device continuously for a month uh, for continuous movement monitoring. And then for all follow-up visits, um, uh, you don't need to stay overnight in Oxford if you're coming from far away or you don't need to come uh, the day after. What happens is that uh, we do all uh, assessments and all questionnaires in one day and then uh, you go home with this watch-like device um, we, which you again wear for a month. So it's a repeated pattern that happens five times during two years. Um, so I would like basically now to continue by listening to questions if there's someone that wants to ask something more specific. Um, and of course, our main aim is to work together with families to understand the Angel Angelman syndrome and also to develop meaningful outcome measures which can be used in clinical trials. So if anyone would like to receive uh, invitation and material for the study, these are our emails. So please feel free to drop us an email and we will get in touch by sending you all um, all the material that we have already put in place uh, and have a lot of details about the study. So um, yeah, I don't know if there are any questions um, in the audience right now. Yes, either. Hi, thanks very much. Really, um, really fascinating. Uh, great work. Um, I'm just wondering if you are going to be uh, using the um, the record the video recordings. A lot of us have got uh, quite a an extensive library of video recordings of our children and grandchildren over months and years. Um, and I just wonder if you're planning to harness that at all in the study. We can do only what is planned in the protocol, uh, which means that if it's not planned, we we cannot do that. Um, and, and the reason why it's not planned is that um, there is today an effort, especially in the, in the pandemic situation, to develop measures of outcome at home on videos, which is extremely interesting, but it's still a work in progress. Um, it's organized by a company that is called uh, uh, Casimir. It's going to be part of one of the trial um, and that is coming. But at the time we wrote the, um, the, 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 the protocol for the, for the natural history study, uh, this was not yet um, in place. So the short answer to your question is no, for methodological reasons. And also you hardly can imagine the, the amount of restriction that we have when we conduct such a study in terms of guaranteeing the anonymity of the of the participants to protect confidentiality privacy and so forth and so on so um the videos uh, that are performed at home unfortunately are, are very difficult to deal with in terms of privacy and in in protection of of individual data so the short answer is unfortunately no despite despite the 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 the, the huge interest that it could have Thanks very much. Yeah, really fully understood. Thank you. Young. There is someone who is called hi. Young. Yeah, hi there. Good evening. Um, we're enrolled to come and see you guys actually next week, which is which is good. <laughs> um, just wanted to ask if there was um, anybody else in this group that's already been. Um, maybe Tamsin, not sure, <laughs> um, how we go about the monitoring for 24 hours to a very uh, hypersensitive and active and strong six-year-old boy. Uh, to me, that seems an impossible task. Please elaborate. Uh, it, I, I'm not going to tell you it's easy. It's not. Um, but but there are, there are two, two things. The first one is that it's part of all assessment in all clinical trials. So if if the final aim is to include your son or your daughter into a clinical trial, we, we need to get to the idea that, that we will need to make this assessment. The second good news, if I might say, is that um, we've been working and we've been learning a lot with the first patients. And I, I really want to thank, by the way, those who were the first in the studies. And, to be honest, things are doing better and better with 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 the experience. So I'm not saying it's a, a piece of cake, 
uh, but uh, it is going better and better and and we need to be ready because actually in the in the out in the protocols that are coming it it is part of the assessment so we'll do our best to, to make things as smoothly as possible okay thank you we'll see you next week see you yeah a b Hiya, good evening. Um, firstly, thank you for taking the time and um, going through this with us. Um, mine's just a very quick question. My daughter has been invited um, to take part in the research. She's six years old, but she will not wear the device. Um, she is very averse to having anything on her hands and legs. And I'm afraid that will um, negate us from being able to participate in this. Um, is there any other way we can get involved? Because I cannot see her wearing that device. OK, so I, I fully understand. Um, I agree that I haven't seen any patient with Angela Mann who, who is willing to have a device on, on the ankle, uh, on, on the wrist. But be, believe me, at the ankle so far, it has not been an issue in any patient. So, my, so the, the device is worn at the at the ankle, please give a try. Um, I mean, if you don't live too far away, just come and, and give a try. So far in all clinical trials, um, the, so we have now uh, given this device to, including in the Gentex trial plus that trial, to more than 20 patients or 25 patients. And yes, if you put it in the wrist, it's a no-go, but the, to the ankle so far, it's not an issue. This brings back to the, uh, this device is part of INS and GTX trial also. So again, I mean, we, we can try to, to avoid all procedures, but, but sooner or later we, we will need to face it in, in the trials. And, and the, the reason is that um, we, we don't want to overburden patients, right? Um, the problem is that we need objective outcomes, and that's why there is EEG, and the, the, that's why there is monitoring. Um, devices. Um, the during the last fast summit um, were presented the, the the placebo data of of Neptune trial. Believe it or not, there is a huge placebo in Angelman trials. Um, what is your global impression? Is your son or daughter doing better? The placebo group is doing better. So, which means that if we want at the end of the day to bring on the market drugs that works and not to expose patients during years to drugs that do not work, uh, at one point we need objective assessment. And, and, and the aim is not to overburden patients and family. Um, the aim is, is really to capture something you can reliably measure. And, and otherwise, I can tell you that everything that is subjective um, as a huge placebo effect. So please try and give a try to ankle um, because that's worn on the ankle and so far it has been extremely well accepted by patients at the ankle. Okay, uh, again from a scientific point of view I absolutely understand and I get the um, importance um, of all of this so I understand that you know e every single aspect is absolutely important. It's just I I have tried um, um, simple things like um, ankle jewellery or whatever, and she's been very averse. So again, I'm not saying no, it cannot be done. And again, we, we can give it a try, but it's it's just one of those where if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Anyway, um, but thank you for explaining all of that. And I'm sure there's somebody else who's got more questions. May, may I just so, say something? So, so let's, let's give it a try. And if it's not successful, I offer a piece of Belgium chocolate. <laughs> I think that would be worked as a treat. Yeah. So basically, I think that overall, um, the fear of one of the assessments not being successful should, ho should hold no one back from coming to the study because we expect that some things might not be possible in the end. Yes, this might happen. That doesn't mean that the rest cannot be uh, used in a meaningful way. So the fear of something not being successful shouldn't hold anyone back. Uh, then if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. That's another story. OK, thank you. Really appreciate it. Yeah, exactly. And, and Doha is perfectly right on that. I mean, the, the aim is not to, to make anybody suffer, right? Life is too short for that. 
uh, the aim is, is to try and, and sometimes, you know, when we started this recording at the ankle, everybody was saying this is impossible. Actually, it's very, it's, it's, it's very easy. Um, the, the, the same applies for EEG. We have progressively shift our mind it after two or three patients. I, I was thinking I, I, I'm going to advocate against a EEG anywhere. Now things are, are, are doing better. Uh, again, if something is not feasible at the end of the day, we just don't do that. And then we try to collect as, as much data. We, we just try our best. Um, um, okay. So please, please don't hold back. OK, thank you. Welcome, you're welcome. So now okay. the most famous sentence of 2020-21, can you see my screen? OK, um, uh, I, I think you can. So actually, um, the, we have a, a pipeline of trial um, going on. Um, and the, they, they are not at the same stage. Um, we have GTA Weeks 101 that has started and we have included two patients. So um, we have INS 5A2, Aka Alos, uh, that we are uh, we aim to start in, in the coming um, three months, let's say. And then we are in discussion with two companies uh, that are called Scout. Uh, it's not the company, but the trial um, and PTC for gene therapy. Um, as you might imagine, um, when we start a trial uh, or we start, uh, we, we set up a trial, we, the first thing we do is to sign lots of paper of confidentiality. Um, so I, I understand this can be frustrating, but there are things that we cannot just say publicly. Um, because if the information is not publicly available, um, and I disclose this information, I, I can be deeply, deeply in trouble um, and, and cannot continue to, to, to help you. So please apologize that that's just that that we had to sign this confidentiality agreement and I can only share with you the confidential informations, the non-confidential informations. So uh, I, I've checked before setting the slides that, that I was sharing with you this, this information. So let me talk to you about the, the trial that we have started. Uh, this is a trial for patients with deletions, right? So far, it's only patients with deletions more than four and less than 17 years old. This is the criteria today. I'm not saying that in a further step of the trial, in a further uh, step of the clinical development, this, this criteria will not be um, extended and it, it can definitely happen that um, later down the line the, the 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 next step of the development could be to include patients with another kind of mutations with a younger age with an older age but but that's it uh, today the patients must be stable for seizures um, and to make a, a long story short uh, you don't need to have an additional, you cannot have a kind of additional issues that, that, that can interfere with the safety um, of, of the patient. And last but not least, um, we need to be able to conduct an anesthetic regimen and for lumbar procedure, lumbar punction procedure, uh, because this is actually a lumbar punction that we're doing and in, it's an injection. Um, and this is impossible, of course, without general anesthesia, right? So it means that on a regular basis, every month at first, then um, every uh, three months, we need to conduct a general anesthesia um, and, and to, to conduct uh, a lumbar punction. Again, in this trial, there is an EEG, 24-hour EEG, and there is a, a, a movement monitor. Uh, the exclusion criteria, um, again, you, you cannot have um, an additional disease, and I'm not going to read all of this, hepatic, renal, pulmonary, and so forth and so on, that can interfere uh, with the, with the um, uh, injection, with the, with the, the trial. Um, you cannot be in another trial, you cannot be in two trials together. Um, and you, you cannot have used, of course, gene therapy uh, before. Um, what we've learned so far with the two patients um, that have been included is that uh, this is not an easy one. <laughs> this is not an easy one at all. Um, 
to conduct uh, general anesthesia on a regular uh, uh, point of view is not easy. In the pandemic, I can tell you that it's not easy at all. Um, if it's not the patient who has the COVID, is the doctor, but someone gets COVID at one point. Uh, so that that is a difficult trial um, to conduct, and there is a huge burden uh, for the family taking part. Um, it's very frequent visit to the site, um, and this is an early phase trial, which means that the main questions that we're trying to answer is the safety, right? Um, what is safe and what is the right dose? This is exactly the question that we ask in this trial. Um, as you may or may not know, in the early phase in the US, in the very first trial, uh, some efficacy data were reported. Um, and unfortunately, uh, because the dose was much higher, there was a sudden and expected serious adverse reaction. And, and patients developed a disease called polyradiculopathy. Um, and transit uh, during a, a short period of time, lost ambulation. Thanks God it was reversible and all these patients have recovered today. The, the dose has been dramatically lowered. Um, but just to say that when we conduct trial, we need to be ready to face the fact that you could have uh, adverse reaction or adverse event, right? Uh, we do our best. We follow very closely our patients. We are very connected with the patients, with the parents. Um, but um, we, we, we cannot be 200% sure that nothing will happen because by a matter of definition, we conduct a trial to answer a question. And the very first question we try to assess is the safety. Um, and the uh, uh, and then the dose. Do not ask me because you will do, but I will not answer these questions. How are doing our patients and if they are improving? Um, this is a confidential information, so I I will not answer you. Um, I can just tell you that the company um, has reported positive effect in the in the first trial. Um, and again, I, I, I want to be extremely cautious with the fact that that when it comes to global impression, um, you can have a placebo effect. This being said, on objective measures like the one that is conducted with with uh, remote monitoring, so with the watches that you that the children were at the ankle, there was a, a objective improvement of the gait of the patients. Um, that's what we know today. Um, but I, I cannot tell you more about the two patients we have included. Um, I just can tell you because this is absolutely true and can easily uh, be um, understood from the protocol that it's not an easy protocol. It is burdensome. It is frequent visit. Uh, we are continuing this this protocol and, and we are doing our best to try to include a third patient. Um, the second trial that, that we will start soon is HALOS um, or ALOS, I don't know how to say it. It's a, also an oligoantisense nucleotide uh, and it's also intratecal injections. There are two differences in terms of inclusion criteria. The first one is the age of the patients, two to 50 years old. Um, so it's much broader. Um, and the, the genotype also, it's much broader. So it also includes patients with point mutations. In terms of exclusion, um, the, the, the patients who are excluded are the paternal uniparental dysomy and the imprinting defect. Again, all patients who have a associated issue uh, will, um, uh, cannot be included um, in the trials. Um, the, as you might imagine, the, the beauty of the natural history study is that we, we can identify already patients who are checking um, the box, ticking the box uh, for the inclusion. Um, and the second beauty of the natural history study is that it really helps when a company come like PTC or Scout to easily check if we have patients who match uh, with the inclusion criteria. 
um, and, and being able to line up the patients by the natural history study is extremely important uh, because indeed th that is what what makes the credibility of a, of a center, of a clinical trial center, to be able to say, well, we have four, five, six patients uh, who are in the inclusion criteria. And as long as we, we're not limited by the fact that we need to find the patients, the only thing that can limit us is, is the clinical trial capacity, the anesthesiologist and in the bloody COVID-19. So that that's where we are today. Um, SCOOT is a trial um, that aims to investigate the effect of uh, um, a component against an, uh, epilepsy and the epileptic component in, in the patients. I've checked today, but I could not find a lot of public information, so it's difficult for me to share the synopsis that I've received uh, confidentially from the company. And PTC, you've heard about them, um, have developed the AAV9 um, gene therapy um, and a year or so, the protocol, as long as I've um, found um, this morning on the internet, is not yet um, public. So um, it's difficult for me to go into detail of the protocol. Um, the, on a general perspective, keep in mind that we're talking about early phase trial, which is fascinating, interesting. Um, but again, um, we, we, we're doing that to answer a question. And the very first question is the safety and the dose. Uh, so we don't conduct a trial to treat a patient and to um, help a single patient doing better. We conduct the trial because we want to bring efficient drugs on the market. We don't want to expose kids to drugs that do not work and have side effects. Um, but for that, we need to conduct trials. The natural history study is really what helps us not only to validate the outcome, to get a very precise information about where we are in the UK, but also to line up the patients for the trial. And believe me, it is um, a strong, strong rationale for companies to come in the UK and to conduct trial in the UK. And it's extremely easy for us to um, include patients if we know beforehand how many patients are available and willing to come um, into trials. So this being said, it's 847 and I think it's it's definitely time to take the the, the questions. Good evening everybody thanks for the um, update really useful. You talked a little bit about the burden of the general anesthesia are you in a position to give us a little bit more detail about what that might look like uh, what what um, specifically what types of of burdens patients and families are, are facing in that regime? Yes certainly I, I, I'm in a position um, so, for instance, if you get an anesthesia today, the procedure, the procedure that could change, um, if you get an anesthesia on on Wednesday, you need to have a COVID-19 test on Monday. Um, this COVID-19 test, of course, needs to be negative, and then you need to self-isolate between the COVID-19 test and the anesthesia. Uh, then come the 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 anesthesia. Um, the anesthesia itself is quite short. It's like all together between the moment the patients come into the room and the patients go into the room, it's about 15 minutes because we use this time also to make the blood sample and to avoid making blood tests in a, in a patient when he's awake. But the, the procedure uh, goes quite fast. Then the patients um, go to the, uh, has to wake up, he wakes, he or she wakes up quite, quite quickly. Um, and the problem that we have faced with the first patients um, is that the patient, um, the first thing is that he or she feels angry, he wants to eat. Um, it's difficult to explain that it's no time to to eat too much, that, that you should start slowly by drinking a little bit, by eating a little bit, um, and then could come vomiting and headache because of um, the procedure because of the anesthesia, because of the fact that the patient has eaten um, too much and too fast. So we had some headache and vomiting um, after the procedure. Um, one of the patients during one, one procedure had to stay in the hospital because he or she um, was vomiting um, after the, the procedure. 
so now what we do is that we book uh, anyway, uh, whatever the parents are willing or not, an hotel close to the hospital. Um, and if so that so that if if at 6 p.m. the patient is OK, but but, you know, still a little bit nosy and so forth and so on, we prefer the patients not to travel for three or four hours and we prefer the patients to stay close to the hospital um, and, and not having to travel. So that's mostly the um, the difficulties, let alone the fact that, as you might imagine, with the COVID-19, sometimes the we are short of staff. Uh, uh, the, the the nurses are uh, uh, self self isolating or or on sick leave, and so sometimes we have to to shift um, the, the 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 agenda and the schedule because we have a very limited number of slots. So that that's all the practical let's say burden and the change in the agenda because of 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 the anesthesiology, but also the context of of the COVID nineteen pandemic which hopefully will go better and better with the coming weeks. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. My pleasure. M, if we've got someone called M was a question. Yeah. Hi, Hi. M. Um, we would like to ask, like, how often um, do you do the um, uh, lumbar punctions? And um, if you are just loud testing like a a higher doses by each puncture or how does it how does it work actually we 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 start with a loading dose which is every month um, and then after three doses there we we ask we have a, a procedure that is called the cgi so the global uh, uh, clinical impression and we try to figure out if the patient is doing better or not according to the to the response we give a, another dose or we can um go to the maintenance dose and, and then there is an escalation uh, by a group of patients. Um, so there is a pretty standardized procedure to increase the dose and to modify the, the frequency um, of the dose uh, from patients to patients and group to group. OK, thank you. So if, if there is no other spontaneous questions, if you have, please raise your hand. If there is no all the spontaneous questions, maybe we could take the one that has been sent beforehand. OK, so um, the first question is, uh, could you please advise how many patients um, are yet to be dosed as part of the GTX 102 trial? So you mentioned that you're looking for the third one, but is there more? Yeah, so in, in general, because we are not the only site nowadays, there is still something like, like uh, 18 patients to be dosed in this trial and then um, they, they, they will be a phase afterwards. Uh, so yes, they are they are still slots. We're not looking actively for patients. We have already all patients we need in the natural history study. Um, the the what we're looking is, is slots with the anesthesiologist, um, which is our, our main limiting factor. But the good news is that we we are building a solution to increase the capacity at the at the anesthesiologist level. All right, yeah, so um, there is a urine trial in Australia. Um, what, what needs to happen for it to be extended to the UK? Well, it needs to, to the, the, the willingness of the company to extend the, 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 the clinical trials. And this willingness comes from the need, of course, to get approval in, in other countries than Australia. And if you have developed only in Australia, there is probably no chance that you will get approved somewhere else than in this fantastic country so um you you certainly need to 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 move in other countries to move in another countries uh, you need the funding i mean um going to other countries is is definitely expensive so what may happen in a clinical trials is that the the company um when the company has enough data to get the funding um to uh, to move to uh, uh, to next step then then they do right uh, but to get the funding that you need to have some positive data or something that can be exciting for for investors so to make a long story short it's mostly the willingness of the sponsor who owns the treatment and the 
ability, the, the, the financial capacity of the sponsor to move to other countries. Okay, thank you. The next one is about the HALOS trial. Uh, when are you actually planning to start dosing patients? Well, I, I'm always very, you know, cautious because I know that as long as we have not dosed the first patients, anything may happen. Um, nevertheless, uh, I truly hope that, that we will start before the summer. Okay. Can I ask a question, actually? Um, what is the difference between those clinical trials? So what's the difference? But I, I, I appreciate the fact that um, without going into <laughs> too technical a detail, but I can imagine that there's parents that are thinking, well, if I had a choice, which one would I want to be enrolled in um, from the um, the gene TX to the Ionis to the um, gene therapy? Um, what are the differences? Um, so first, it's not the same drug um, as you might imagine. Um, so uh, if you ask me which one is the best, I'll tell you, uh, according to who you ask, you get a completely different question, uh, answers. Um, so uh, the short answer is nobody knows. Um, the inclusion criteria are not the same, right? Uh, to be entirely transparent with you, I, 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 I don't think that today we are in a position where we will offer to the same patients two slots uh, and say, well, you know, you can choose uh, Make, so the, the way it works, at least in our team, is that if we have a slot uh, and we have the possibility to include a patient, we offer this slot. Uh, and it's not like if you are in a restaurant, there is a menu and you can, you know, make your choice. We, we are not at this stage. Um, I, I prefer being transparent with you because this is the reality, right? Um, that's also what happened in spinal muscular atrophy. In the early days of spinal muscular atrophy, when we were starting sequentially um, uh, oligoantisense nucleotide, then gene therapy, then resdiplam, it, it has never been a possibility to tell a patient, well, you know, we, we have three options, uh, which trial would you prefer? We have never been in such situation. And, and honestly, I, I hardly imagine that this will happen in, in, in Angelman. So the 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 the, uh, the overall design of the trial is slightly different in terms of dosing, in terms of of dose escalation, in terms of um, dose before the 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 loading dose. Um, so I think it's probably a little bit technical to to go into the detail, uh, but again, outside the inclusion exclusion criteria that are quite different between both trials. Uh, I really don't think that it will happen very often, even a single one a time that that you will receive kind of open choice between different slots because the number of slots is so limited that that um, I hardly imagine it will happen that way. Um, another question related to the um, the natural history. So I, I believe you said the oldest patient that you have is thirteen. But thinking about the Ionis trial, which will um, look at people up to the age of 50, are you are you looking for older patients um, to be included in the um, the natural history study? So, yeah, it's exactly. any age. So yeah, I think that it's uh, uh, until 99 years. <laughs> uh, so uh, joke aside, uh, yes, we we are taking much older patients. And um, th this this will certainly give these older patients, if they are willing, a very good chance to be included in INS trial because so far we don't have old patients and, and they will be caught for older patients. So short answer is yes, we are more than um, happy to see any old patient, older patients in the natural history study and, and especially in the context of, of Ada's trial that is coming. I think previously there's been quite a bit of um, kind of information within the Angelman community that these sorts of treatments are likely to only 
be effective in younger children um, and may not have any effect at all in, in older people. And, and I wonder if that's why there's not been many people coming forward that are, that are older, because there's this, this um, perhaps a misconception that it, it's not for that, you know, it's not meant for them. Exactly. So I, I think that there are plenty of reasons, but this is probably one of the main reasons is that, to be honest, it, myself, I was quite surprised when I saw that they were including patients until the age of 50 years old. That, that would not have been my first feeling. I'm happy, to be honest, that, 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 we, that we are opening this possibility um, even for all the patients. So I think you're right. And, and, and that's also why we have this kind of event, right? It's to openly discuss uh, this kind of this kind of change in our understanding, in our conception to update you because this is the information that is not that easy to find by yourself. So short answer is probably um, and, and next part of the answer is this is an additional reason um, it, to consider natural history, because again, if you ask, let's imagine uh, Elas or Ionis tell me, well, we have a slot for you, guy. If you find tomorrow a patient 18 years old, I don't have a patient 18 years old in my hand. So I, I, I cannot jump on the slot and take it. If I had such a patient in a natural history study, I could I could immediately include these patients, right? So that's exactly why we running natural history studies to know which patients we have around. So so far, indeed, I, I, I will. And, and you know that's so important so for for study setup because as you might imagine, it's not the same setup for a 35 years old or a two years old, right? I will not inject the 35 years old in the pediatric theater with pediatric anesthesiologist. It will be injected in the adults. So if I now set up the trial for ALOS and I don't have any adult patients, I'm not going to make my life more difficult than it is and I'm not going to to go to the to the to open a full you know flow for patients for adult patients if I don't have adult patients right if I know that I have three adult patients and that parents guardians are super committed to to go in the trials then it was to suffer a little bit to organize the flow of patients at the other side, but otherwise I don't. So again, th that's why we conducting natural history studies to know who we can, who we have to work for. And just to add something on that, there's generally the, the tendency to believe that for uh, nervous system uh, diseases that if a critical period passes, then uh, it's somehow like like a critical time window is lost, but uh, for Angelman syndrome, the truth is that we don't know yet. And there are some preclinical data in my studies that they tested treatments at different developmental uh, stages. They found that for some specific functions, a chance to reopen uh, uh, the, the critical period for specific functions if you reinstate the UB3A in the cells. And I will share with you the publication in the chat. But it's pretty clinical just to clarify that, right? Um, there's one other question, if I may. Um, how realistic is it for only one parent or carer to accompany the patient during the visit for the natural history study? Well, actually, it is realistic. Uh, we we had also during trials patients who came with um, a single parent. I'm not. It really depends of 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 a few of, of the child so um but during the, the the clinical trials we also had visit with a with a single parent and I'm not going that it makes things easier but we, we we could manage i just to clarify something we do not restrict i don't know if it was like because someone heard in the past that because of covid rules we were restricting uh the number of people on site but it's not oh. the case in case the question is because we restrict that we don't restrict the number of people on site anymore because of any rules. So more people can come and it doesn't have to be necessarily the primary or secondary care. It can be any help from the environment if, if there is. Just to clarify that. Um, in case the question was raised because of previously um, raised issue of restriction on site. No, I think it's more of a about the concern about would uh, would it be possible to come with them and participate in the trial 
from someone who is still considering. Yeah. So, yeah. so the, the, short, the short answer is whatever is the easiest for you, you can go one parent or two parents. What is the benefits of the study beyond the area of therapeutics development? That's yeah. So several things. The first one, so why, why do we do that? The, the very first thing, and this is a direct individual benefit for patients, is to line up patients for trials and to know how many patients we have and, and, um, and to speed up recruitment and to speed up uh, study setup and attract studies. That's one of the main reason. The second reason is that at the country, um, at the country uh, level, I mean, I'm, I'm being extremely, extremely involved in the in the uh, approval and the in the reimbursement of the of the uh, products for spinal muscular atrophy. And having data in the UK is extremely important. Um, from the NICE perspective, from a, a, a MHRA perspective. Uh, so it's to support for future um, uh, qualification and reimbursement in the UK. Um, same applies also, as you might imagine, for pricing. Um, I mean, pricing is, is just impossible if you don't have the single clue about the burden of the of the disease for 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 uh, for patients. Then the, the next thing is that uh, we also paving the way for, for other diseases, especially in terms of outcomes. Um, I, I'm currently involved in, in an effort in a much more rare condition, much more rare than a gentleman, um, also an epileptic encephalopathy. Now I can tell you that what we we are learning in a gentleman and with the natural history study is extremely important to develop in other conditions. Um, so um, that's, I would say, the, 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 the main benefit. Uh, the, the Another one is, of course, for standard of care. I mean, um, getting a better understanding of everything that may happen um, into the disease uh, helps to, to, to fit uh, standard of care. Um, I have a similar experience with a, a rare myopathy that is called X-linked myotubular myopathy, for which now we have a gene therapy. Um, I can tell you that we, we conducted a natural history study before the clinical trials, and we have learned a lot. Unfortunately, the drug has not been approved, but we have learned a lot about standard of care, what we should fear, what we should be careful of, what we need to consider, because if you have one, two, three, four patients something may happen once and you will say, well, this is a coincidence, right? But if you if you see 40 patients um, or more because you share with the, with your colleagues abroad, then you can say, well, this is not a coincidence and we should be careful of this um, when we consider the patients. So that's all of, of the rationale and the benefits of, of the natural history study. Okay, so if, if there is no other questions, if I may wrap up, I think that we are facing a fantastic period of time. Um, we, we are starting now. When last time we we at this webinar we were talking about starting a study, starting trials. Now we have started the study and we have started the trial. Um, and I'm pretty sure that next webinar I will speak to you about the four trials that we have started um, and about many more patients. Uh, this is feasible only if we act as a community. Um, we need to act as a community globally uh, to to support not only the care of individual patients, but to to support the care of the group of patients of the community in the entire country and 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 beyond. So I think that's one of the main reasons why we have such an event tonight, um, because it's important to share and to share the information. Feel free to contact us, and and if you have questions if you wish to discuss individually the 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 the, um, the case of of your son or your daughter please feel free to contact us and we'll be more than happy to answer any of your questions so i think that you have our emails if you don't i will again write it in the chat and and probably you know it's it's not activated but i think that our emails are broken yeah i'm just gonna share the screen very quickly to show uh, the publication link and the, and the emails because um, I cannot use well it's completely stuck
Do you want to go on with the community updates if you want to say something and then I will try to enable the chat? It looks stuck for, for the time being, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, from Fast UK, we've got uh, we've got Irina that just wanted to uh, just give a quick uh, update on, on the community. Hi everyone. Um, I guess a couple of things that I wanted to mention. Um, one thing is that um, if you're following us on Facebook or Instagram, or if you haven't um, yet, so please join us. And um, we're sharing lots of videos and um, and information there. Um, and obviously, very grateful if you can participate in discussions and. Um, share it wider to raise awareness. Um, also, um, we have uh, done the corporate fundraising um, pack uh, recently, and um, th that is a great tool to approach any uh, employers or um, any small businesses that you you have um, around where you live, um, if they want to support um, the, the charity so that um, we can support the initiatives such as a natural history study going forward as well. And um, um, also, there are some initiatives like park runs um, that is happening in October or any other challenges that you would like to participate, please do let us know and we'd be happy to support from like if you need, need any um, marketing materials or if you need any um, merch um, for that, then we'll be very happy to support. Um, and obviously, um, there is a comp um, CAN campaign, Cure Engine and Now campaign that is supported by Fast Global. Um, that is now live, um, so please sign up and, and do your fundraising events um, so that um, it's a great initiative and you can see some examples in the US that have been quite um, successful. So it's, uh, it's really a great way to raise awareness and and obviously funds then for, um, for such great cause. That's all very important to all of us as parents and carers. Um, so I guess that, that's the key thing um, that I wanted to mention. Um, and um, I think Katie from Angelman UK, if you want to add anything. Yeah, so just something um, very quickly um, from me. Um, I'll just quickly share my screen. So um, just to say, so so Angelman UK is, um, for those that may not know, we um, are a participant within the Angelman Syndrome Alliance. Um, and there are quite a significant number of, um, uh, of uh, countries that are now involved in pooling their funding so that then we can, um, can fund research. Uh, the next, the results from the next um, call is go are going to be, well, um, privately uh, decided uh, within a week and then publicly announced in May 2022. Um, and just to let you know that there is going to be a scientific conference um, coming up. Uh, the next one's going to be in Austria, in Vienna. Um, so please um, save that date if you're interested in coming to, um, to a, a, a conference about the, the science um, that's going on in, um, around Angelman syndrome, um, including um, uh, clinical trials. So that, that's it from me. Okay. So I think that's it. Yep. Thank you, Laurent, and thank you, Dora, yeah. for giving a, an amazing presentation on, on everything scientific. And I'll, I'll be seeing you next week as well for the uh, natural history study. So great. So I can't enable the chat, unfortunately, but if you search our names on Google and the email, it should come up on the Oxford website. So it should be easy to find our emails. Unfortunately, the chat is frozen. I don't know. I can't do anything to enable it right now. Another another option is um, if you would like, um, you can DM, I think, both Human UK and Fast UK on either Instagram or Facebook, and we'll be happy to put you in touch. Well, I'm, I'm going to put my email, wait a moment, um, on the, um, in my, presentation that I can share on the screen. Uh, okay, I just checked that I haven't made any mistake. It's fine. Um, and here you are. So laurent.servet at pediatrics.ox.ac.uk. That's my email. 
and if you want to write Doha because you don't write to you don't want to write me you just uh, want to write Doha it's still Doha dot marketing at the same address at pediatrics.augs.ac.uk Yeah, we can share that on the social media as well um, so that people can easily access it. <laughs> can I just add one thing very quickly? Um, if there are any parents out there who um, are considering the natural history study um, and want to talk to a parent who has done it with their child already, um, then um, I don't know if this is allowed, but um, then contact me. Um, I have done it with Amelia, so I'm very happy to talk to anyone who, there are many people left here, but if anyone wants to pass it on, then I'm delighted to chat to anyone who wants to about the process and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, so call me, message me, email me, do whatever. <laughs> very happy to talk. <laughs> Yeah, same with us. Um, we've done it with Emily as well. Um, so very happy to share our experience. Thank you, Dora. Thanks, Laurent. See you very soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Nice to see you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.